doctor and professor Andrea Morash. So Andrea did her uh, her undergrad studies at Mount Allison University, which is in Eastern Canada. And in fact, that's where she is now as part of the professoriate. She then did her PhD at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, and then spent time in the UK at Cambridge, as well as uh, in Australia, um, working with a, a number of organizations and institutions down there uh, where she got pretty sharky, uh, but also uh, did uh, work on aquaculture physiology. And so uh, if I were to describe the kind of work that uh, Dr. Morash does, it's really a, a, a really fascinating blend. It's, it's very fishy uh, and it's a fascinating blend between work on wild fish as well as work on cultured fish. So. Uh, sort of applied physiology in this uh, fish conservation uh, and uh, obviously from a, a culture perspective, uh, trying to support livelihoods and economic activity. And so with that, without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Andrea Morash, who's going to talk about understanding the unique physiology of elasmobranchs. Welcome and thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Steve, uh, and thank you all for joining uh, from wherever you are today. Uh, I see lots of familiar names in there, but also names of uh, some people that I haven't met today, so I'm excited to be able to uh, chat with all of you uh, new people uh, about some of the work um, that I do. Um, so I'm going to talk today uh, about some of the uh, unique physiology of uh, elasmobranchs and how we uh, relate that to um, their conservation. Um, and I'm excited to be the first uh, speaker in this series. Uh, if you've come today for the sharks, I hope that you stick around uh, for the conservation of, of all the other different types of animals. Um, it's going to be a really uh, awesome series of webinars uh, over the coming months. So please make sure that uh, you return back to see all the exciting stuff. Um, that's going to happen. Um, so I'm going to talk today uh, about uh, ketone body metabolism specifically um, in elasmobranchs um, and their response to stress. Um, I managed to uh, get into this particular realm of research in a very convoluted way. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the history of kind of how I made it from my PhD to this uh, point where I'm at now uh, studying these animals. Um, and hopefully that'll give a bit of an idea, especially for our early career researchers out there, that uh, things are not always uh, a linear path. Uh, you don't always kind of end up where you started out um, and uh, you can kind of follow your passions and work your way around and kind of weave your way uh, into different areas of research to kind of get um, where you want to be. Um, so I'm a comparative physiologist by trade. I study all different kinds of animals. Um, kind of within the realm of metabolism. So I'm interested in how metabolism is different between different types of animals um, and how they regulate and change their metabolism to be able to respond to uh, environmental stress. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about my path to get there uh, and then a little bit about uh, some of the data that we've collected um, and what we are working on now. Um, so before uh, I get there, um, I just want to uh, acknowledge that uh, I live and work and play uh, on uh, land that's located uh, within Mi'kmaq, the unceded and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq peoples. Uh, our relationship and privilege to uh, live in this territory was agreed upon by the Peace uh, and Friendship Treaties of 1752. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge and pay respect to the Tasmanian Aboriginal people uh, as the traditional and original owners uh, and continuing custodians of that land, because a lot of what I'm going to talk about today uh, took place uh, in Tasmania and Australia. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge that uh, as well before I get started. Um, and as Steve mentioned as well, I'd also encourage you uh, to take some time wherever you're watching this from um, to uh, understand and learn uh, about the traditional custodians of the land uh, in which you're on uh, and make sure that you're acknowledging and respecting um, the local Indigenous and Aboriginal peoples uh, in your particular location as well. Uh, so as Steve said, I did um, my PhD at McMaster University uh, with Grant McClelland, um, and most of my research there focused on uh, fatty acid metabolism and lipid metabolism uh, in animals. Um, and I worked on uh, what I've not highlighted here, which is a, a small 
uh, but very important enzyme that regulates um, lipid entry into the mitochondria to be able to produce energy. Uh, and I studied the heck out of that uh, enzyme and I found it super fascinating and I was really interested uh, in lipid metabolism. Um, but in the process, uh, I also had to get an understanding of all of the other um, cellular mechanics and other things that were happening uh, in terms of energy production uh, in the cell. So of course, fatty acids are not the only way that uh, cells can generate ATP. Um, so we worked a lot understanding uh, the glucose pathways. Um, and Grant also introduced me um, to ketone body uh, metabolism as it relates to uh, elasmobranch physiology. So as I was studying uh, fatty acid metabolism, one of the things that came up was that uh, this one particular group of animal uh, has a very unique um, metabolic arrangement in that most of their tissues outside of the liver um, don't use fatty acids and they rely uh, on ketone bodies, uh, which I found uh, super fascinating. Um, of course, I wasn't working on that. It wasn't part of my uh, research or my thesis then, uh, but it was something that really piqued my interest um, at the time and that I knew uh, I wanted to pursue um, as I moved further along. Um, so I focused a lot on kind of substrate metabolism and how uh, changes in an animal's physiology or changes in their environment might impact um, what substrates they were using to make energy and how that would impact um, their sort of life history traits uh, and so on. So after I finished my uh, PhD, my first postdoc uh, was at the University of Cambridge um, with Andrew Murray. Um, and uh, Andrew works um, <clears throat> mainly on uh, heart health and mitochondrial physiology, uh, kind of from a clinical and human uh, perspective. Um, but I was interested in learning more about um, mitochondria. Uh, he was also just starting some work on ketone body metabolism. So this was a natural migration for me to kind of go and get into the details of this uh, area of metabolism. Um, and so Andrew and I um, worked kind of further on this idea of ketone body metabolism and how it might relate um, to heart function um, in mammals. Uh, we were looking at uh, how lipid catabolism and protein catabolism from skeletal muscle might play into this kind of whole animal response um, and how ketone bodies might help to be uh, protective uh, for heart tissues. Um, so I was there for a couple of years uh, working with Andrew on this uh, substrate selection and ketone body use um, and the response to either environmental hypoxia in the heart or disease states in the heart uh, where the heart becomes starved for oxygen. Um, and that was great. I learned a ton uh, there, but of course we were doing this kind of in the clinical setting, uh, mostly with mice and rats. Um, but as many of you who know me will know, <laughs> uh, fish are kind of my true passion and I wanted to get back in the water. Um, so after a couple of years there, um, I took a second postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Tasmania uh, and CSIRO in um, Australia. Um, and I was there to mainly work on some aquaculture uh, physiology. Um, but during that two-year period while I was there, um, Susie Curry, who many of you likely know, uh, she came down um, on her sabbatical to do some uh, research, elasmobranch research with uh, Jason Simmons. And those of you who uh, work with elasmobranchs are probably aware of Jason's uh, work as well. Um, so Susie came down to um, work uh, on a project on the environmental stress uh, on elasmobranch physiology with uh, Jason. And of course, uh, I knew uh, Susie quite well prior to that. Um, and they had asked me to join in uh, on this project uh, to help look at the metabolism uh, side of um, this elasmobranch physiology that they were going to be working on. Uh, so I owe a debt of gratitude uh, to both Jason and Susie for inviting me onto this project because it really started uh, to spark all of the work that I've been doing um, in elasmobranchs. And it kind of allowed me to start to further hone in and refine on where I wanted my research path uh, to go as an independent researcher. Um, so this project uh, was focusing on two species of uh, smaller sh uh, sharks, the gummy sharks and the school sharks uh, in Tasmania. Um, and we were looking at um, their physiology as it relates to uh, changes in salinity in the particular uh, nursery areas uh, that where the juveniles exist. 
Uh, so we were studying uh, animals from the Pitwater Estuary uh, in Tasmania. So to just to get you located, um, the Pitwater Estuary is here on the, the uh, southeast coast of Tasmania. So it's a pretty small estuary here, adjoins to Frederick Henry Bay, and then that goes out um, to the open ocean. So the Pitwater Estuary uh, is a significant nursery area uh, for school sharks, but also gummy sharks uh, and other species of, of elasmobranchs and uh, holocephalans that exist there. Um, it was declared a shark refuge in 1962. Um, and so it's a super important area uh, for some of the uh, juvenile species uh, to spend those first uh, period of their life to avoid predation out in the Frederick Henry Bay, where um, one of their main uh, predators, the seven gill shark, uh, tends to hang out. Okay? So the seven gills don't come into the estuaries, so the juveniles tend to uh, spend a lot of time uh, in there as they're growing and developing uh, before they migrate out further uh, into deeper water. And so you can see that this estuary is quite shallow. Um, and it's quite a challenging environment for these animals to exist in uh, because the salinity can range uh, between 19 to 49 parts per thousand. So it gets a lot of fresh water uh, input, especially during uh, rainy seasons or when there's storms, uh, the, the salinity can drop quite quickly over just a few hours uh, down to that kind of brackish area at 19 parts per thousand. Uh, and occasionally during really hot, dry uh, periods in the summer, it goes up uh, super high, up to 49 parts per thousand. So you can imagine that there's a real um, osmotic challenge here for these uh, juvenile animals that are spending time um, in this estuary. It also ranges uh, quite a bit uh, in temperature. Um, so it's not the easiest place uh, to exist, but it also provides the safety uh, against those predators. So the questions um, that Susie and Jason were looking to tackle uh, under that current project were to understand what are the osmoregulatory challenges uh, for these sharks and how does it relate to their movement into and out of the estuary, how long do they stay there, uh, when can they leave, and so on and so forth. So that work uh, resulted in a couple of papers, uh, one in uh, conservation physiology uh, and the other one in the Journal of Experimental Biology. So we investigated uh, both the uh, problems with hyper salinity, so really high saline conditions uh, and hypo salinity um, in both of those uh, species of sharks to understand how they would respond differently um, to these conditions. Um, so that was some really uh, interesting work that we did. I'm not going to touch too much uh, on those, but if you want to find them there, you can uh, look up the references um, to see some of the information about how these animals uh, responded uh, under these conditions. Uh, this work uh, is also being continued now uh, by Kate Allerhead, who's one of Jason's current uh, PhD students. Um, so you may be able to see that coming out in the future. Uh, as I mentioned, typically those changes in, in salinity in this area uh, are the result of changes um, in weather. Okay, So the uh, low saline conditions in the brackish water are typically during the cold, uh, wet winters. And when it becomes very high salinity, it's usually in these hot, dry summers. So typically we see these uh, really salty conditions when the temperature is high and more brackish water when the temperature is cold. Uh, so Kate is now looking into the combined effects of temperature challenges and osmotic challenges, um, particularly in the uh, school shark. Um, and she's investigating the metabolic rate and behavior and changes in blood metabolites. Uh, in both neonatal sharks uh, and juveniles to get an idea of how uh, their developmental life stage is also impacted. Uh, so having an idea of how these sharks are uh, impacted by the environmental challenges at these different life stages um, will help uh, in the conservation, particularly for this uh, species whose population uh, has declined. Um, so stay tuned uh, for, for that and uh, hopefully Kate will be publishing some of that research um, pretty soon. Uh, the second project uh, that I ended up working on uh, with Jason was in uh, the Macquarie Harbor, uh, which is another really challenging uh, environment. So this one is actually on the west coast uh, of Tasmania. Uh, and this harbor is, is quite a bit bigger uh, and deeper. Um, it's 276 uh, square kilometers, so it's quite large. Um, it has a really high tannin concentration uh, from runoff from uh, mountain range here uh, to the west of this harbor. Um, and this harbor is really, really super stratified. Um, so I'll just show you some um, 
some data here from both the salinity and the temperature as it relates to depth uh, in this area. So you can see that uh, at the surface, uh, most of this um, area is um, freshwater. But as you get down past about 10 meters, uh, the water is pretty close to full strain seawater. So it's at 30 parts per thousand and it stays uh, relatively stable uh, below 10 or 15 meters. Uh, same with the temperature below 10 or 15 meters, the temperature is pretty stable around 15 degrees. Uh, but at the surface, you see this variation and these are seasonal variations here uh, in temperature across uh, winter and summer. Um, in this area. So we have this big stratification here uh, around uh, 10 meters, which is really interesting uh, for the animals that exist uh, here. Uh, there's also uh, major issues with uh, dissolved oxygen uh, in this harbor. Uh, and again, we see uh, the changes here with depth. So at the surface, uh, it's pretty well oxygenated. It's up around 100%. Um, but as soon as you start to go down below the surface, even by five meters, uh, things are starting to drop off. Uh, and then you can see that there's a wide range of um, dissolved oxygen concentrations uh, at the various depths. Um, and what you'll notice here is that even at only 10 meters depth in this harbor, we can get a range of sort of 80 to 100 percent dissolved oxygen uh, all the way down to basically anoxic. Okay, so there's a lot of variability in the available oxygen uh, in various parts of this harbor, um, and it ranges, of course, um, by depth. So there's very little uh, oxygen in some areas uh, of this harbor. You can see the variability uh, here as you get down uh, below 10 meters. Um, and below about 15 meters, um, there's really less than 50% uh, oxygen in most areas. So it's a really super challenging uh, environment. It's hypoxic in a lot of places. Um, and the animals that live here uh, have to uh, endure that uh, and be able to respond to those challenges. Uh, one of the uh, unique uh, and really amazing animals that I've had the opportunity to study in this area is the uh, Magian skate. Uh, this skate is endemic to this harbor, um, and it's also uh, critically endangered. There's a few thousand of them uh, left that exist in this one harbor. Um, they rarely, if ever, leave. So the tracking data that uh, the people at uh, UTAS have been able to collect suggests that they don't actually leave the harbor. So they spend their entire life uh, in this really challenging uh, location. Um, and they're obviously exposed uh, to a lot of um, hypoxic uh, areas. So they typically uh, tend to spend most of their time um, kind of below the 15 meter range. Uh, so they're really not seeing oxygen much higher than sort of 50% um, in their environment uh, because they prefer to stay down uh, where the salinity is a little bit higher. But we do see them moving uh, up and down through the water column. So they're a really spectacular animal in that they can withstand the changes in temperature, they can withstand the changes uh, in salinity and go from sort of full strength seawater uh, all the way up to fresh water. Uh, they can withstand 100% uh, dissolved oxygen all the way down to anoxia. So we see them moving through all of these different um, environmental challenges uh, in the harbor. Um, and it's absolutely amazing that uh, they can survive there. Um, so we were looking to investigate uh, how they actually do it. So how are they surviving? Um, this hypoxia. Um, and one of the questions uh, that was important for us to, to understand was whether or not further changes um, in hypoxia were going to affect this animal. Um, there's a lot of aquaculture that takes place um, in this particular harbor. It's really ideal for farming Atlantic salmon. That industry is looking to expand. Um, but since that has started in this harbor, uh, there's been a big decline in dissolved oxygen uh, overall throughout the harbor. Um, so we were looking to understand whether or not uh, further decreases in dissolved oxygen uh, would impact this animal, and if so, uh, what would that look like? Uh, so this resulted um, in a couple of publications. So the first uh, study we did, um, this is the report uh, to the Fisheries uh, Research and Development Corporation uh, as part of the government there. Uh, this was looking at a lot of the ecology uh, and the physiology as it relates to uh, hypoxia in these animals. Um, and this uh, was our paper that we published uh, also in conservation physiology uh, that was specifically about the uh, hypoxia tolerance uh, for this animal. 
Um, we have since uh, gone back and also started to uh, investigate how these animals respond um, to changes in salinity uh, because we see them moving through the water column. Um, and one of the issues that they would have to deal with if they're leaving these more hypoxic areas uh, that are deeper, as they push back up in the water column towards the surface, they're getting back up where the salinity uh, is coming down closer to fresh water. So if they're being challenged by these hypoxic zones uh, in deeper parts of the harbor, do we then need to understand what's their response going to be uh, if they move up closer to the surface in search of oxygen, uh, but then they have this additional stressor um, of changing salinity. Uh, so these are really, really unique uh, animals. They seem to have a really uh, high capacity to be able to deal with environmental challenges, uh, but they are endemic to this region and they are critically endangered. So we've been working um, to understand um, how they're able to deal um, with these particular challenges. Um, so stay tuned for the second uh, iteration of that uh, once we get that second paper uh, ready to go out. Um, so as I've shown, there's lots of different environmental challenges that uh, elasmobranchs have to deal with. Um, I've worked on some of them, but not all. Um, of course, many of them have to deal with uh, changes in temperature and salinity and acidification, dissolved oxygen. So lots of issues uh, related to climate change. Um, there are issues with uh, pollution and toxins in some areas where elasmobranchs exist. Uh, of course, overfishing is a big um, a big issue as well uh, for these animals. Um, but I'm really interested in how these animals are able to make enough energy during these environmental challenges. So this comes back to sort of my original PhD training that I was really interested in knowing how animals are able to deal with these challenges and still be able to make enough energy to be able to survive uh, and move and grow and reproduce uh, and all those, those uh, traits that these animals need uh, to, to survive. Um, so I've been particularly interested in studying uh, the issue of dissolved um, oxygen um, as it relates to ketone body metabolism um, and how that's, that may be uh, able to protect um, these animals. So I'm going to continue to chat uh, mostly about hypoxia and dissolved oxygen and how that relates uh, to elasmobranch physiology um, and their conservation. Uh, so as many of you are likely aware, um, Environmental hypoxia is becoming uh, an increasing issue uh, all over the globe. Uh, all of those individual red dots that you see on your screen uh, are hypoxic areas. So this is kind of ubiquitous uh, in most uh, coastal areas where it's been measured. Um, lots of problems there with hypoxia. We also see a lot of oxygen minimum zones, especially pushing um, kind of offshore into the deeper oceans. Um, this is particularly bad off the west coast uh, of North and South America here along uh, the equator, it's also some here in the Indian Ocean. Um, and these offshore oxygen minimum zones uh, are becoming larger. Um, and it's also causing issues closer, closer to the coastal areas where many species of sharks um, rely on those environments. So a lot of that uh, dissolved oxygen water, uh, low dissolved oxygen water, uh, gets pushed around because of the oceanic currents and the wind currents that drives the patterns and movement uh, of the ocean. And we often can see some of that uh, water with really low dissolved oxygen being pushed up uh, onto the shelf and closer to the shore. Uh, where we find um, these animals and in combination, especially in the summertime when we see things like phytoplankton blooms um, and decomposing plankton that consumes the dissolved oxygen, uh, we end up with these really hypoxic areas um, in regions that are important for a lot of elasmobranch species. Um, so these uh, hypoxic areas are uh, becoming longer in duration. So the time that these hypoxic zones uh, exist is becoming longer. They are becoming uh, more severe over time as a result of climate change. And so understanding how these animals will respond uh, to hypoxia has become uh, a super important question, especially for those species that rely on these coastal areas in estuaries or in harbors uh, or in areas that are really susceptible um, to these hypoxic zones. <clears throat> 
So typically for an animal uh, to respond to environmental hypoxia, the easiest and first thing that many of them do is to simply move away from that uh, hypoxic zone. Uh, and you might expect that most animals uh, would do that and many of them likely try, um, but they're not, it's not always the case uh, that animals can move. Um, sometimes changing the depth or the location to look for areas of higher oxygen concentration uh, might expose them to other stressful environments. So as I just shown in that example for the Magian skate, for it to come up closer to the surface where there's more oxygen then exposes them to uh, more low salinity water. Uh, for other animals, it might expose them to uh, greater rates of predation um, and so on. So behavior is not uh, always ideal uh, thing to change for these animals. Sometimes they need to stay uh, where they're at. And there's also some species that, that simply just can't move or life stages where they're unable to actually move. So they have to be able to withstand um, these environments, these hypoxic environments as they come up. So there's many species uh, with really high fidelity, so they're not inclined to leave uh, their particular space. Um, there are many juvenile sharks in different regions that uh, stay in particular areas because it's safer there to avoid uh, predators out in the deeper ocean. So they may choose not to leave a hypoxic zone because it would put them in danger uh, of becoming prey for those larger animals. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the eggs of elasmobranchs uh, are unable to move as well. So if the environment in which the eggs are laid uh, becomes hypoxic, then um, this life stage is also going to have to be able to deal with uh, that environmental hypoxia. Um, so in general, um, and I really kind of generalized the response here to um, hypoxia, but I kind of want to break it down into this idea of the need for energy production. So animals need to be able to produce energy to be able to grow uh, and develop if they're a young or juvenile animal. They have to be able to move around uh, for foraging, um, for reproduction, to be able to make sperm and eggs. All of these things take a lot of energy. And all of these things are tied into the uh, sort of ecology and population dynamics of these animals. So understanding the metabolic response to hypoxia and how they're able to produce energy uh, is super important. So we know a lot about uh, some of the physiological mechanisms uh, to enhance oxygen uptake. So if an animal is kind of forced to stay in a hypoxic zone, um, there's lots of ways that we know in elasmobranchs that they can enhance oxygen uptake. So these are things like increasing your heart rate, uh, ventilation, um, changes in hemoglobin and red blood cell function to be able to get more oxygen from the environment um, and to the cells. So we know quite a bit about uh, these physiological aspects um, in several elasmobranch species. Um, they can also uh, use some other physiological mechanisms to decrease energy use. So if you can't get enough oxygen to keep up with your energy demand, you can try to lower the demand to match uh, the amount of available energy that you have. So some species are able to uh, depress their metabolism. Um, some species might rely on limiting things um, like um, uh, protein production, protein synthesis, which is really energetically costly. Uh, so animals can also use these mechanisms to try to even out um, the energy demand and production uh, in the cells. And we know a bit about this uh, in elasmobranchs as well. But where we're really lacking, uh, and what I'm most interested in, and what I think is the most unique part of elasmobranchs, uh, is the substrate oxidation and ATP production uh, in the mitochondria. So we know uh, quite a bit less about this area of their uh, metabolism, but it's also the most uh, unique part and the part that I, I think is the coolest about these animals. So I'll give credit uh, to Jim Ballantyne, uh, who wrote this review about uh, the, metasmo, the metabolism of elasmobranch fishes. Uh, this is from 1997, but it's still a paper that I refer to uh, all the time. Um, it really has all kinds of information about the metabolism of elasmobranchs. And if you're working in this field, I would encourage you uh, to read it. It is a lot of kind of hardcore biochemistry and metabolism. Um, so uh, if you're not super interested in that, it might be a little bit challenging, but it does give you a really good idea of um, the metabolism of these fish. Um, and this really inspired uh, me to learn more about these fish and to try to understand some of the more unique um, parts of their physiology.
So what we do know about elasmobranchs is that uh, they have an exceptionally large liver uh, for their body size. So it's about 20% of their body weight um, as compared to the sort of three or 4% range um, that most other vertebrates have. Um, it's a huge lipid store, so it's mostly storing fats. Um, it serves another purpose as well in terms of buoyancy for these animals. Um, but the liver is really important in oxidizing those lipids and producing ketone bodies for these animals, which I'll, I'll come back to in just a second. So this is really super unique about this, uh, this group of animals. Uh, they have limited free fatty acid transport uh, in the blood because they lacked the protein carrier uh, albumin, which we see in, in other vertebrate animals. So they're unable to circulate free fatty acids around the blood the way that you or I would to supply uh, energy to their working muscles or to their heart um, and so on. Um, so rather than relying on uh, fatty acids for making energy, they rely predominantly on uh, ketone bodies that are released uh, from the liver. Okay, so the liver is really good at oxidizing fat but most other tissues are not. So instead they oxidize uh, fats in the liver, release ketone bodies, uh, and they're the main fuel source for the exercising muscles, for the heart and so on. Uh, they can also use uh, glucose and they have some glycogen stores uh, throughout the body. This is quite variable depending on uh, the species that you're looking at. Um, and they're also able to use uh, amino acids to a certain extent to be able to make energy. Uh, and most of these tissues, as I mentioned, lack the enzymes to oxidize fatty acids. So this is really different from all of the other type of vertebrate animals um, that, that we've studied. And I think that this is a really interesting area of their, their physiology that deserves a little bit more attention. So if you're unfamiliar with uh, ketone body metabolism, uh, ketone bodies result um, from a really high rate of fatty acid oxidation in the liver. Um, so what happens here is that the fatty acids are oxidized, they produce excess acetyl-CoA, uh, which normally would go into the TCA cycle, uh, and then those electron donors onto the mitochondria from there. Um, but when it gets overwhelmed, uh, when this rate is too high, that acetyl-CoA gets formed into ketone bodies, uh, acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. And these two molecules are water soluble, so they don't need a carrier protein in the plasma, so they're released uh, into circulation. They can circulate around the body and be used in all kinds of other tissues. So here's the example in muscle. So they get converted back to acetyl-CoA when they get there, and then they continue on through the normal uh, metabolic pathways. And this is the same uh, in other tissues like the brain and the heart um, and so on. Um, and in most mammals and birds and uh, humans is where we know most of this information from, uh, ketone bodies were really thought of as a substrate that were kind of a backup when glucose um, wasn't available. So we know a lot about ketone body metabolism uh, from our own metabolism, from studying things that happen uh, in humans uh, and also in our lab uh, rats and mice. So the ketone body uh, synthesis typically starts when cells are starved of glucose. Okay? And it's particularly important in the brain because the brain typically can't use um, fatty acids to make energy. Um, so when glucose is limiting, especially to the brain, ketone bodies can act uh, as a backup fuel. So they can get to the brain uh, easily and they can generate uh, about the same amount of ATP as glucose can. So if you are uh, limiting uh, carbohydrates in the diet, uh, if you are uh, in a state of starvation or extreme exercise where you've kind of lost your glycogen stores or plasma glucose uh, has really decreased, Basically, it drives you into uh, having to burn more fatty acids and you end up producing uh, ketone bodies. This also can be a result of uncontrolled diabetes when glucose can't enter the cells. Uh, instead, we start to see uh, ketone bodies being produced by the liver to start to fuel those extra hepatic tissues. Uh, and in some cases, when this is uncontrolled, uh, can lead to ketoacidosis. Uh, of the plasma. So the pH uh, will start to drop in the absence of these really high uh, numbers of, of ketone bodies. Um, and it's been studied a lot uh, in humans for many decades um, because it was discovered very early on that a ketogenic diet, a really high fat diet and really carbohydrate restricted 
um, help to prevent seizures um, in, in children with epilepsy. So there was always this link between uh, ketone bodies and helping to uh, prevent uh, issues in the brain um, in humans. But it went through this big lull over time where um, people didn't really study it uh, too much. They became interested in other drugs to treat things like epilepsy. Um, so there wasn't a ton of information um, coming out, but there has since uh, luckily been a big resurgence um, in ketone body metabolism. Um, and so if we kind of take an evolutionary perspective of how we see ketone bodies being used uh, across uh, vertebrates, we know that in most mammals uh, and birds and likely amphibians as well, um, that they really only use ketone bodies if they're really stressed. So if they're in a state of fasting uh, or there's some type of metabolic disease, uh, but otherwise we don't see them using ketone bodies. Um, and really interestingly, in teleost fish, so we have all of these uh, different teleost fish that exist uh, across the planet, uh, from what we know about studies across many of them is that they don't use uh, ketone bodies really at all. Some of them have a small capacity to do so, uh, but it's very limited. The, the concentrations are well below what we would see uh, in mammals uh, or in elasma brings. And so it seems to be a metabolic feature that's been lost uh, in this group of animals. Um, and then if we look at uh, the cartilaginous fish and specifically in the elasmobranchs, uh, we see this constant use of ketone bodies. So they're using ketone bodies all the time to fuel their extrahepatic tissues. Um, and so the big question that I have that has been bothering me since my PhD when I first started thinking about this is why? Why is there such a big divergence in the use of ketone bodies across, um, uh, across vertebrate animals? Uh, and we don't yet have an answer for that, but uh, if you ask me again, maybe in 20, 30 years, maybe I might uh, have an answer for you then. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm really interested in uh, trying to understand what benefits ketone bodies might have had uh, for elasmobranchs um, as they've uh, evolved um, to use ketone bodies consistently for their metabolism. Uh, so we know a lot about the benefits of ketone bodies uh, from a lot of recent studies um, in mammals, um, we know that they're pretty metabolically efficient, so they can produce similar, uh, and in some instances, more ATP per mole of oxygen, so they're really energetically efficient as compared to glucose. Um, there's been some evidence that they can increase mechanical work uh, with less oxygen. This is from uh, isolated perfused hearts. Uh, we also have evidence that they help to protect against cellular damage, so they help to decrease mitochondrial reactive oxygen species production and they increase uh, ROS scavenging as well. So they help to protect against the damaging effects uh, of ROS. Um, they help to stabilize hypoxia inducible factor or HIF, uh, which is one of the major regulators of uh, the hypoxic response in vertebrates. Uh, they're also anti-catabolic, so they help prevent uh, breakdown um, of other tissues in the body like uh, skeletal muscle, for example. Um, and they also have helped to, pro to um, provide resistance against damage from ischemic insult um, in tissues like the heart. So we have all this uh, data coming out about the benefits of ketone bodies. And as you can see, most of these are related to uh, changes in oxygen delivery to these tissues. Um, so the question that uh, I've been working on is to try and understand if the evolution of ketone body metabolism is maybe somehow related to uh, hypoxia and what impact this might have um, for elasmobranchs um, who, who quite frequently um, will see areas of hypoxia in their environment. So if we look very quickly at the, the evolution of uh, elasmobranchs, uh, they were rising around 450 million uh, years ago, uh, shortly after uh, the holocephalans here, which we still see today. And these are another super unique uh, group of animals to study in this realm as well. Um, but throughout evolution and when uh, kind of the most derived uh, elasmobranchs that we still see today, the batoids and squaliforms and so on, uh, they were really evolving through uh, a lot of different uh, oceanic anoxic events. So if you compare uh, the timeline here, the Triassic, the Jurassic, Cretaceous, and so on, there was a lot of periods of anoxia um, in the regions where these animals were evolving, so within the ocean. Um, so it's curious to me if there's some relationship 
between the need to use ketone bodies um, and um, their protection against hypoxia. So this is kind of the hypothesis that um, we are now working towards to try to understand um, a little bit more. So as a very generalized uh, response to acute hypoxia, what we see in most other vertebrate animals, so the non-elasma branks, is typically a switch away from fat oxidation towards uh, glucose oxidation. Uh, when animals are stressed, uh, usually things like uh, cortisol, the stress hormones, um, cause a big dump in, in glucose into the blood, and, and the tissues are able to use that uh, to make energy. Uh, fat oxidation is limited because it tends to produce ROS under hypoxic conditions, which can damage the cell. Um, and then we usually see some accumulation of lactate uh, from the process of glycolysis. Uh, we also have some uh, details about the response of elasmobranchs to hypoxia as well. So they can also resort uh, more to glycolysis. Um, as yet, uh, the, the hormones that control the stress response uh, are still being worked out by a number of, of other researchers. So I'm interested to see uh, how that sort of plays out and, and what role they play um, in the glycolytic response in these animals. Uh, we still see them accumulating lactate as well. Um, and what we're working on now is to understand where uh, the changes are in their ketone body metabolism. So we have uh, two very small pieces of evidence, one uh, from another paper in epaulette sharks, where we see a change in circulating ketone bodies, uh, and also from our Magian skate as well, that there seems to be an impact. Um, but what we don't know yet um, is whether or not that change that we see in the plasma is a result of a change in the production of ketone bodies uh, or a change in use, uh, because as they're being produced, they could be liberating to uh, the plasma, but they could also be taken up at a higher rate at the tissues if they're using them uh, more to generate more energy. So we don't yet know uh, how ketone body metabolism changes in response to hypoxia, uh, but stay tuned uh, for information from Ryan Wall, who's my uh, new master's student, who's looking at the effects of hypoxia on ketone body metabolism, uh, what the energetic advantages might uh, actually be for elasmobranchs um, for ketone body use when they're exposed to hypoxia, um, how is it uh, affected by both acute and chronic hypoxia, as well as fasting, uh, because typically fasting is a stimul stimulus uh, for ketone body metabolism in most other animals, um, and also how it's regulated. So we don't know very much yet about what controls uh, the rate of ketone body metabolism um, and so on. Uh, and so lastly, I just want to touch on this idea of uh, the biomarkers that we use in elasmobranchs. Uh, as many of you know, they're a challenging group of animals to study. Uh, we have some model organisms that are uh, smaller and a bit more sluggish and easier to keep in captivity to do some of these more detailed physiological studies. Uh, but lots of them are very hard uh, to capture and to track and to be able to get tissue samples from uh, and to understand uh, their physiology. So especially the bigger, more active sharks um, are, are hard to study and many of them are very hard to keep um, in captivity. So this idea of using biomarkers to understand the metabolic state of these animals um, is super important. And so if we can add um, markers from ketone body metabolism might give us a good idea of uh, what's happening in these animals because they're one of the main fuels uh, for energy production. Um, whereas in other animals, we typically use things uh, like plasma glucose to kind of understand stress levels and, and what's happening in the animals. Um, but we're still working out what that corticosteroid response is uh, in elasmobranchs. We don't know how that impacts ketone body metabolism and a variety of other things. Uh, but knowing this information might be helpful for us uh, to be able to understand some of those larger, uh, harder to work with elasmobranchs and how they're responding uh, to hypoxia in their environments. Uh, so just to uh, wrap things up, uh, I hope I've uh, shown you today that elasmobranchs have a really unique metabolic arrangement that comparatively with lots of other animals, we still know very little about um, their mitochondrial function, how they're producing energy. Um, and we need to understand how their environment is impacting their energy production, because that energy production is really the basis for their growth, their reproduction, their movement. And this is going to impact the ecology uh, of these species. So if we're working towards conservation of these animals, getting an idea of how their environment is impacting uh, their metabolism, metabolism as a whole, and specifically their ketone body metabolism, 
uh, will help us understand how they might respond to current uh, or future changes in their environment. And this is not just for hypoxia, it'll be important to study this as well, the changes in temperature, uh, ocean acidification, and so on. All of these things are going to impact um, this area of their metabolism. So I'll wrap it up there. Uh, thank you to all of the species that I've had the opportunity uh, to work with. Uh, thank you to all of you who are here uh, and all of the research that many of you have participated in um, and have published uh, has been a really great source of inf uh, inspiration for me. Um, and thank you to the uh, funders for a lot of the work um, that we've done so far. And I look forward to sharing our upcoming research and hope to provide uh, more concrete evidence uh, towards this uh, most recent uh, hypothesis for ketone body metabolism in hypoxia.